head attack while he was gone, and then he chased Doyle. And they had a few confrontations before Doyle made it back to Camden. Now, Marion was despondent because his militia all went home. Now, in spring, they'd been in the field much longer than they were required to, and it was planting time, and the families needed them, and they went home. Now, Marion, of course, when he had commanded regular troops, had complete control over them. And he was disgusted by now with militia, and he spoke of going to Philadelphia. And I suppose that he hoped that Congress would give him an assignment with Continental Army. But then he learned that, like, that Light Horse Harry Lee was returning. And when Lee came back, he had no ammunition, but he told of Green's campaign to take back the South. From that point on, Francis Marion is once again a Continental officer commanding militia, but dedicated to Green's campaign. For the most part, he wasn't always cooperative, but usually he was. And they moved against Fort Watson and started a siege. Now we're now, Marion is involved in conventional warfare. And you know they took Fort Watson, moved to Fort Mott, and started a siege. Again, not a hit and run guerrilla operation, but uh, conventional warfare. And after Fort Mott fell, Green comes down and meets Marion for the first time. And wouldn't you like to be a fly on the wall for that meeting? Now it is said that Green reminded Marion that he, Green, had not taken a day's leave since the war started. Of course, by now he had fathered four children, so he wasn't always in the field. But <laughs> Francis Marion was evidently uh, comforted by the attention, and there was no more talk of going to Philadelphia, and he moved back across the Santee River, uh, intending to uh, intimidate the Tories and to keep attacking uh, Georgetown, which he did. Now, there was sort of a falling out with Green because Green then moved on to, uh, to Siege 96. And he ordered Sumter and Marion to prevent Rawdon from moving out of um, Charleston uh, to break the siege. Well, Marion's men would not come. I mean, 96 is a long way from home, and their horses were tired, their families needed them, they were militia, they had served their time, and they didn't come. Well, uh, and Sumter did a little bit better, but uh, he stationed his troops at uh, Orangeburg, thinking that Rodden would use that road, and Rodden didn't, so uh, he missed Rodden, and Rodden broke the siege, and Green was irritated, and he ordered Marion and Lee to cooperate with Sumter. Uh, that did not go over very well, and they avoided Sumter as long as they could, but eventually they served under him at Schubert's uh, plantation in a disastrous uh, battle. And after that battle, in which they had taken, uh, Marion and Lee took several um, casualties. They uh, uh, loaded, they didn't even report to, to uh, Sumter, they loaded the dead on their horses, uh, removed their wounded and moved into the swamp, and that night buried the dead in a common grave in the swamp. And Bass writes, stunned and grief-stricken, Francis Marion left the field in silence. Now he knew he had been right in his appraisal for Thomas Sumter. His dead and wounded justified his former reluctance, foot dragging and refusal to fight under a man whose courage exceeded his judgment. 
he resolved never again to fight under the command of the Gamecock, and he never did. Now, Lighthorse Harry Lee was less charitable, and he wrote, General Sumter has become almost in universally odious, as far as I can discern. I lament that a man of his turn was ever useful, or being once deservedly great, shall want the wisdom to continue so and preserve his reputation. And he too uh, reported to Green. And shortly after that, Green stopped trying to make a team player out of Thomas Sumter. Now, after another attack on Georgia, Georgetown, and Marion took the, the place, um, there was a problem uh, within the ranks because Colonel Hayne was hanged. And he was one of Marion's colonels. And Marion was livid, but was warned by Green to not to seek revenge on the Tories uh, because there were political ramifications. The British, remember, had all those prisoners down in St. Augustine. And uh, so they had to be concerned about retaliation. But a little later, uh, Marion was asked to go down across the Edisto River to uh, um, support Colonel Hardin. And he found that Fraser, who had been the British <coughs> officer who had captured Hain, was now at Hain's plantation. And Marion set up a, an ambush in the swamp by the causeway leading to Parker's Ferry. And lured Fraser's dragoons down onto the causeway. <coughs> And in the ensuing fight, um, Jarvis, who rode, rode with Fraser, reported that 137 men of Fraser's command were killed and many more wounded. And uh, Jarvis said not a single enemy was ever uh, uh, shot at, but Marion reports his loss as one private killed and two privates wounded. He moved back to Pierce Plantation uh, and discovered that Green uh, had moved out of Camden, across the river at Camden, uh, across the uh, Congaree at uh, the Howells Ferry, and was now north of Utah Springs where the British were encamped. Now Marion was also on the same side of the river, but he was south of where the British were camped. And at night, he took roughly 265 mounted riders around the British camp and was never detected. Now remember, he lived, had lived in the area, and he joined uh, Green. Now at the Battle of Utah Springs, Marion commanded the first row, first line of militia. It was the format that Morgan had used at Cowpen successfully, that Green had tried at Guilford Courthouse less successfully, but Marion commanded about 750 militia on the first line. And as long as they were in the woods, uh, the militia fought very well and inflicted tremendous casualties on the British who couldn't mount a bayonet charge. Um, James comments that they probably fired between 18 and 20 shots a base. Now, once they got into the cleared area, of course, uh, Maryland and Delaware troops and Virginians and North Carolina uh, provincials stepped up and, and uh, uh, took the charge. Now, on the side of the, on the right side, they moved through forward and through the camp. And uh, the 64th Regiment of Foot on that side of the battlefield turned and fled the field. Their history indicates the only time that they ever, in their history, turned their back on the enemy and fled the field was at Utah Springs. Now James says, we heard the huzzas and we knew what it meant. They thought the battle was over. Well, we have about 4,000 muskets shooting black powder, and I think eight cannon shooting black powder, and that field was immense. They couldn't see from one side to the other and had no idea that William Washington 
on the far left had run into difficulty. And so command broke down, uh, and uh, Green uh, tried to regroup, but he had uh, British soldiers who were uh, now in the barricaded garden, and uh, in three stories of the, the house, and he withdrew. Now he intended to fight again the next day, but when he came back the next day, the British were leaving, and he did not attack. He was interested in the territory, and the, the British were evacuating it, and they were moving toward Charleston. Five weeks after Utah Springs, Lord Cornwallis surrendered his troops at Yorktown. Now, the war wasn't over because the British had over 5,000 refugees, uh, Tories, in uh, uh, Charleston with over 7,000 uh, slaves, the residents of Charleston and the British Army, and they had to feed them. So there were many more conflicts. And Rutledge and Green realized that as they approached a treaty, they needed to establish a civil government. And they did at Jacksonboro. Now, we have now Marion, a senator in, in the, uh, the, the new government, and he is still uh, being depended upon by Green. Now, a couple of years ago, Dave, did a marvelous presentation on the demands on Marion at that point in time. Now, Rutledge wanted him uh, in the government so he could have a quorum. He also wanted him to move Tory families whose men had already deserted to Charleston, and he wanted to move them out of the back country and shove them into Charleston, let the British worry about them. And Green, knowing that they were about 20 miles from Charleston, wanted him to uh, protect the government. And so we have a, just a frenetic few weeks when Marion is just all over the place. He did engage in a couple of uh, more uh, skirmishes, but there was a command difficulty between Ori and Mahan, and uh, the brigade just didn't work as well when Marion wasn't there to shepherd them around, and so he didn't do too well on the last few uh, uh, engagements, although he wasn't actually defeated, but uh, he withdrew in good order, but he was not happy with the brigade. Now, eventually, the British were prepared to evacuate Charleston. Now, the, t the Council of Charleston planned the Victory Parade. These are the same people who signed a letter of congratulations to Lord Cornwallis when he won the Battle of Camden. Now, they've been whining and dining, the British officers, and now they're planning uh, the, the new uh, takeover of command. And, uh, Wayne, Generals Wayne and Green would lead the Continental Army in. No militia was allowed in Charleston even as spectators. That is really gratitude, isn't it? Marion was invited to go by, uh, to, by Green as his guest and he said, well, they had, they had smallpox in Charleston. He'd never had it and so he declined. And a few days before the evacuation of Charleston, he assembled his troops at Fairlawn. And, and in their dismissal, he thanked them for two and a half years of the most miserable existence man had ever endured. Uh, remarked that if the unhappy country ever needed them again, he knew that they'd do it again. And he took his leave and went back to his ruined plantation, which had been uh, really savaged by both friend and enemy alike. Uh, ten of his slaves finally came out of, from hiding and joined him again. And in his fifties, he married his cousin, Mary Esther, who um, had money. 
and helped rebuild his, uh, his plantation. And he became, again, a very successful planter, uh, especially of indigo. Now, he died when he was about 63. And um, he really, I mean, he, he left a, a, a very strong um, impression on the people who knew him. But he was not a charismatic man. And uh, uh, people beyond his circle and, and here did not know him. And then, of course, uh, William Jennings Bryan wrote the poem about the uh, uh, Marion and his, uh, his men. But Marion, as an officer, established himself as a brave and cool-headed commander in the Indian Wars, performed efficiently at Sullivan's Island, led his men into battle, the siege of Savannah, and considered the attacks on Georgetown, Watson, Fort Mott, these were not hit and run. So we must not forget that Marion was an officer of tremendous leadership ability. And all those abilities were tested time and again when he was needed and in whatever capacity or circumstances he found himself. He was highly regarded, certainly by Light Horse Harry Lee and by Green himself. And Green, uh, early on in Marion's career, wrote the following. To fight an enemy bravely with the prospect of victory is nothing, but to fight with intrepidity under the constant impression of a defeat and inspire irregular troops to do it is a talent peculiar only to yourself. Nothing will give me greater pleasure than to do justice to your merit, and I shall miss no opportunity of declaring to Congress the Commander-in-Chief of the American Army, and to the world, the great sense I have of your merit and services. So Francis Marion is stranger than the fiction that has built up around him and which continues to portray him. We have to remember he is far more than a swamp fox. Thank you. I told him I'd break his arm if he flipped that way.